schools around the world are shut and many big sporting events have been postponed. Businesses as well are changing the way they work. Let's take you to Singapore now. They had some of the first cases of COVID-19 outside China, so in many ways they are ahead of the curve. And what's happening there now may well become the reality for a lot of countries. Here's Karishma Vaswani. Business as usual, under unusual conditions. I'm at Singapore's largest telecommunications firm. And as you can see, adding new precautions into everyday life has become part of the routine here. These thermal scanners are now a common fixture across buildings in Singapore. If your temperature is above 37.5 or 38 degrees Celsius, they're not going to let you in. Morning. Turns out I'm okay. But what companies are really worried about is business continuity. How to keep operations running while keeping their staff safe. Some companies have asked their employees to work from home, but that can be challenging, especially if you have young kids running around. Others have adopted the split shift strategy, which means two groups of employees never see each other. It's been great for tech firms providing services like online training, virtual conferences and virtual meetings. And for some companies, productivity has actually gone up with happier employees enjoying their time working from home. With most people not traveling for work or conducting their business meetings online, the airlines and travel industry, they're suffering too. Frankly, we still don't know just how much the coronavirus is going to cost the world. But one thing's for sure, it's forcing all of us to take a deeper look at how we work in a globally connected world. Well, we've had lots of questions about traveling from all over the world. Simon Calder is here. Simon? <laughs> We're going to take a question from Sean from New Jersey. He asks, I'm going skiing in the French Alps later this month. What happens if the error is placed under quarantine while I'm there? Will travel insurance cover it, Simon? We're in uncharted territory. Sean, I must say, please be very careful. You could well be driving in twisting mountain roads in terrible conditions. You're going to be going down a mountain very swiftly on skis. This is real risk. The tiny possibility that you might be in proximity to somebody with the coronavirus, I think is not really worth worrying about. But given that it is a possibility that you will be kept in some lovely Alpine village, the evidence we've seen, and there aren't that many exemplars, is that you will be fed and watered and your airline at the end of this unfortunate uh, incarceration will be flexible and get you home to uh, New Jersey um, without too much fuss. So how often are you saying to people, Simon, no, I don't think you should travel right now? Oh, well, you, you, if your government says country X, region Y is too dangerous, don't go there. Apart from anything else, it will generally invalidate your travel insurance. But everywhere else, it's a wonderful time to be a traveller. And if you look globally at all the risks, top of the list, of course, is uh, uh, road accidents, which claim nearly 4,000 victims a day worldwide, it's still the case that travel has never been safer. Yes, the coronavirus is a worry. Yes, each of the nearly uh, 4,000 deaths have been a tragedy, but it is still not a uh, significant risk, at least in my risk. So rates. given the advice differs from country to country, what's the one piece of advice that you've been giving people, Simon? Well, if you're in one of the vulnerable groups, or you're an older traveller or you've got a weakened immune system, then be circumspect and have a look at where the threats are. Otherwise, just um, if your government says it's OK to travel somewhere, go there. It's wonderful. Have a lovely time. Jake, what about when you get on board that aeroplane? Should you be quickly sanitising the seat? Should you turn off the air vent? Is there something you should be doing on board of an aeroplane? You should relax and enjoy your journey, really. <laughs> um, so planes are clean regularly. They're clean very professionally. Um, uh, use your hand sanitizer gel if you've got it. Wash your hands. Be mindful of your hand hygiene. Washing our hands, keeping our hands clean is the most important thing we can do to stop the spread of this virus. And Simon, are airlines changing their policies as well around cancellation fees? Uh, they are, like but they're doing it in quite an unhelpful way. What they're trying to do is stimulate bookings. So in the past few days, we've seen a rush of airlines saying, hey, everybody, book your flight. And if you need to change it, we'll allow you to do that without the usual uh, change fee. Um, that doesn't apply regrettably to uh, previous um, uh, trips that you might have organised and a lot of people are feeling very bitter about that but again 
just go. Travel is good for the body, it's good for the soul. And it's very good for the host community as well. It enriches everybody. Absolutely. The economic implications of not travelling are quite big. Jake, big question here. Is science going to come to the rescue? Where are we at with a vaccine? Uh, so uh, vaccines are being studied and being developed, um, but they are months away. So we're probably talking six to 12 months before anything becomes available. There's lots of other research going on, um, in, including looking at potential treatments for those people who do become unwell. Tulip, what's your big message to people who are nervous or worried? I think being nervous and worried is completely natural and normal. Um, prepare yourself and inform yourself. So it's great we're doing this program. There's lots of information online. There's the one thing every single person can do, and that's obviously washing their hands regularly, as we've seen, for 20 seconds, several times a day. But it's also important to remember that the World Health Organization is saying, look, this thing can still be contained. We saw what happened with China. There were so many cases. It was looking very frightening there. And actually, cases are in decline now. We are seeing these hotspots popping up in other parts of the world now, which is a major concern. Of course it is. But there is still hope there from some of the world's leading scientists that this thing can still be contained. How is it going to be brought under control, Jake? Because in China, they were draconian measures that really can't be implemented in every country. True, I agree with that, but we can all do our bit. So this is about a sort of global responsibility, being good members of society. So yes, if you do get it, likelihood is that you'll get a very mild illness, but you may pass that illness on to people who could get more serious illness. So the more we can do now to stop our infection from spreading to other people, the better. So that means uh, uh, making sure that you catch your sneezes and your coughs in tissues, getting rid of them in the bin, uh, washing your hands, uh, not only after blowing your nose, um, but as often as you can. Um, and if you have symptoms, make sure that you follow the advice, which in the UK would be to self-isolate, get yourself away from people, and then seek help by, uh, for example, calling our helpline in the UK. But Jake, what is the potential of the coronavirus? How bad could it get? So um, based on what, what we have uh, the, the information available at the moment has come from China, really. And as Tulip said, that they have been through uh, a, a significant ordeal recently, but their containment uh, efforts seem to have made an impact on uh, the duration of this virus in parts of China. So um, we do need to keep containing, but the likelihood is that a lot of people around the world will get this infection. What kind of percentage are we uh, looking at? We, I mean, we, are most of us going to get it in a minor way? So uh, we don't know yet. There are um, some predictions and there are ranges of predictions. Some say as high as 80% uh, of people may get the infection. But remember, the majority of those people who are infected will still get mild illness based on what we've seen in China. And how big an issue is the underreporting? of coronavirus, particularly in countries like Iran, Tulip? It is a, it is a major concern and, and again the World Health Organization right from the start of this outbreak was saying the world needs to come together, everybody needs to be really open about what's happening, happening in their country. What we're seeing in Iran is a significant number of cases and the largest amount, a number of deaths outside of uh, China uh, and it's also because of the sanctions that are there, because of some secrecy with that country as well. There just seems to be quite an unclear picture and it needs to be absolutely clear as it as clear as it can be. Information needs to be shared internationally because if one country drops the ball, then the rest of the world will be I impacted. mean, briefly, Jake, are you worried that some health systems simply won't cope? So um, we are worried. The WHO is worried as well. Um, and everyone is working very hard to try and support the countries with less well-developed healthcare systems and with fewer resources. So again, it comes back to that global community helping each other. Okay. Well, it has been an information-rich 25 minutes. I hope you've found it useful. If you want to find out more, of course, please go to BBC Online. We also have uh, plenty of information on our news app for you as well. It is all there for you. So our thanks to Jake, to Tulip and to Simon as well. Your information has been invaluable. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. And I think the message from all of us is keep washing your hands, everyone. <laughs> and thank don't you. panic. And don't panic.